Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome uh, and express my gratitude for uh, to each of you joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you with us at this webinar. Uh, today, we are diving into an important and timely topic, India's Digital Personal Data Protection Act, better known as DPDP, and we'll be exploring the intricacies of this legislation, understanding how organizations can prepare for compliance and discussing the ways in which our team and our technology can assist in navigating these new requirements. And so today we are fortunate to have a lineup of distinguished speakers who will share their expertise and insights on the DPDP Act. I'm confident that the presentations will be informative and helpful, providing valuable perspectives on this critical subject. So throughout today's session, I encourage you all to make the most of the Q&A feature. It's a great way to engage with us and uh, the speakers and we'll be dedicating the last 10 minutes of the webinar to answer your questions. So please feel free to share your thoughts and questions as we go along. Additionally, to make our session more interactive and to hear from you, we'll be rolling out a poll sometime during the webinar with a few questions. So once again, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I hope you find today's webinar both informative and helpful, and I think we are okay to, to get started. So our first, first speaker today is Mr. Nanaya Kalangara, uh, a renowned business consultant and data privacy expert. And Nanaya will be giving us an overview of the DPDP Act and discussing its significant implications for organizations. Nanaya, how are you today? Are you ready to share your insights with our audience? Absolutely. Thanks, thanks, Maria. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Uh, we are eagerly looking forward to your presentation. Uh, so moving on, our next speaker is Mr. Sukarn Singh Maini. Sukarn is a distinguished technology lawyer and data protection authority. He will be delving into the legal obligations under the DPDP Act, providing critical insights into compliance and the legal landscape. Sukarn, it's great to have you with us. Are you prepared to guide our attendees through the legal intricacies of the DPDP Act? Yes, thanks. I'm looking forward to having a positive interaction with the audience today. Thank you, Sukarn. I'm sure your exper expertise will be invaluable uh, for today's discussion. Uh, and, uh, and finally, uh, myself, Marian Bracic, uh, CEO and co-founder at Legit. I'll have the pleasure of speaking about our product, Data Privacy Manager, and explaining how it can assist your organization in protecting personal data and minimizing privacy compliance risks, making compliance with the DPDP Act smoother and more manageable. So all of us together, we hope to provide you with a comprehensive understanding of the DPDP Act and practical insights into achieving compliance. We are here to assist you in navigating these new regulations effectively. Let's begin with uh, our first speaker, Mr. Nanaya. Nanaya, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, thanks, Marion. Um, I'll, I'll largely, uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining uh, this webinar. Uh, we'll keep it very precise. Uh, I'll I have two slides to talk about. Essentially, you know, kind of recapping on, uh, on the act, uh, the key definitions of the act, uh, and what it means for the industry uh, from a preparedness and the need for preparedness uh, point of view. Uh, as, as you would see, the the act has got broadly three clear definitions. That is the first one being the data principle, which is you and I as, uh, as consumers or, or users of the service. Uh, we, are, we are the data principle. In case of GDPR, it was referred as data subject. 
Um, and as you as you go through this presentation, you'll realize that uh, all the rights of the data are with the data principle. So the data principle is at the heart of this uh, uh, heart of this act. So that's that's a data principle. That's the primary definition. The second one, you know, is the data fiduciaries uh, are the organizations who are collecting data, using data to provide service, uh, support, whatever that is required. But these are all the organizations. An example could be a bank, could be an e-commerce company, uh, or could be a, a real estate company, right? So uh, any of them who are collecting data, and specifically we're talking about personal data. I think there's a lot of debate about uh, the data and the personal data, and uh, this act is primarily for the personal data. So that's the data fiduciaries, which who, who's who is actually collecting the data. Significant data fiduciary is an extension of the data fiduciary definition. This is uh, uh, to be determined by the Data Protection Board uh, and the government in terms of uh, who in the country would be called as uh, significant uh, data fiduciaries. Obviously, the significant data fiduciaries will have a lot more obligations than the data fiduciaries themselves in terms of uh, need for compliance, right? So we'll talk a little bit more about it, and Sukan will, I think, throw and bring in more light on, on that subject as well. The, the last one is the data processor. You know, the data processor is an entity which is involved in processing the personal data. Uh, an example of uh, a data processor could be looking at my own background of being in a credit bureau. So credit bureau is a data processor or any anyone who is providing a customer support function, uh, which is uh, sometimes outsourced, could be a data processor or uh, somebody who is helping uh, financial sector, maybe banks on collections, could be a data processor. So any, any third party who is involved in providing service uh, to the data fiduciaries are data processors. So these are the broadly three definitions. That is data principle, uh, data fiduciaries, and data processor. Significant data fiduciary is an extension and um, to the data fiduciary de uh, definition. So that's uh, that's broadly how the act is built. And uh, that's uh, the, the rights and the definitions are all built around uh, these these definitions. Just moving into um, the rights, the, as I mentioned earlier, the rights are all with the data principle. That is, you and me, you and me, all of us as individuals, all of us as consumers, the, the right of our data, our personal data is with us. So it is a right to access, right? You know, so if somebody has uh, collected the data, a bank or an e-commerce company or a real estate company or a healthcare services company, have collected the data, uh, all of us have rights uh, to understand uh, where the data is used and what is it used, what's the purpose for which it's used, right? And and you, you have the right to say that I give consent for using my personal data for the following and not for the following. An example is that when you give a personal data, you know, can the data be used for the marketing purposes in that organization? So there has to be a consent from the individual. So. It is specific, explicit consent that needs to be obtained from the data principle, that is you and I, uh, for any of the personal data to be used. And access to that uh, should be available with uh, the data principle, that we should have access to understand you know, what is the personal data and where is it being used, right? That's the, that's the first one. Second one is, you know, at any point in time, uh, correction and eraser uh, should be available to the individual. Now, when I say correction and eraser, you know, uh, there is it's, it's very clearly defined in the act in terms of at what point in time a eraser of the data can be requested only after the service is, you know, provided and completed. So, for example, if it's in the banking environment, you know, personal data is collected for the purposes of uh, approving a loan. Uh, midway through the loan cycle, you know, one cannot request for a cancellation of their personal data from the database. It's not possible. So it has to, only after the loan cycle is closed, one could request. However, uh, what is important to note is that, you know, the banks or institutions which are giving out loans in, in case of financial services, they also have a, a regulatory requirement of retaining the data after the loan is closed. So so it is the DPDP Act plus the, the the act of the regulatory body, which will determine at what point in time a request for erasure of data can be considered. But however, the principal has a right for correction, right for erasure of the data. And I talked about the consent, um, you know, consent that needs to be obtained by the organizations. 
it's it's also right to withdraw the consent at some point in time again subject to fulfillment of uh, the requirement for which the consent was given uh, but the data principle you and i have the right to withdraw our consent at any point in time so that you know the data fiduciaries cannot use the personal data uh, any any longer beyond that point right so there is right to withdraw the consent as well it is not a perpetual consent it is not a lifelong consent uh, it is specific it, it has to be called out explicitly by the organizations and it is time bound so uh, the again rights are rights are with the with the data principle a right for grievances if uh, there are any questions or any concerns about where the personal data has been used uh, beyond the consent, uh, the scope of the consent, uh, the individual has has a right for redressal, right? And you know, so organizations who are collecting the personal data should have a facility to ensure that any grievance is addressed immediately and appropriately, right? So the right to grievance redressal is with the data principle. And in, in any event of, you know, the data principle is not able to... Uh, uh, participate or incapacitated, you know, he has, uh, he or she has an option of nominating, right? So right to nominate is also provided from a, from a data rights standpoint. So, you know, if you look at it uh, in summary, uh, the entire rights of your data, our data, our personal data is with us. I think that's the, the, the pivoting movement of uh, this act uh, has to, the rights of your data is in your hands. So, that's, I think, uh, it's it's a it's a the big step. Um, uh, as all of you know, the the act has been approved, and we're awaiting notifications. Uh, and I think as the notifications comes, you know, a lot more clarity will come in terms of uh, the implementation guidelines. Moving to you know what it means for organizations, uh, uh, getting a little bit more specific. Uh, if you look at it from a regular operation standpoint. Uh, you know, the good starting point is always to figure out where exactly is your organization at this point in time from a data privacy compliance standpoint. It's not that everybody is starting from zero or somebody is starting from at some point. So it's, it's, I think it's important uh, what is already being complied with, what we need to do more, assessing the current state of data privacy as to is very, very important starting point. Otherwise, Maybe you know the starting point could could be could could be wrong or could be right or could be missing some steps. But I think this is uh, you know level set. You know setting the stage for the entire implementation of uh, the requirement of the act. And um, the second thing that we realized um, across you know even talking to Marian and others uh, in in other geographies where uh, the Data Protection Act has been implemented. You know for example even GDPR and EU. Uh, organizations um, uh, really need to find out as to where all in the organization the personal data is residing, right? Uh, we all tend to think, you know, personal data is residing in our core systems. Uh, we suddenly realize it could be sitting in our CRM systems. Oh, suddenly we realize that, you know, the data was shared with uh, our analytics organization to either build a model uh, or, you know, build uh, build an information graphic. So I we really, you know, didn't have full control of where exactly the personal data is residing in the organization. So I think it's very important to understand, or it could be a, it, it could be with a third-party service provider, a personal data, and it could be you know it could be with a department wherein a personal data was shared at some point in time, not in use at all at this point in time, which is typically called as a dark data. Dark data is a data which is which is collected but not utilized, and it is just lying there in the organization. And nobody is even paying positively attention to it because it is not being used, right? So it is very, very important to understand where exactly the personal data is residing in the organization. And creating that inventory of the personal data is a is a is a is a second starting point once you have assessed as to what is the state of privacy compliance of the organization. So once you know where all the personal data is residing, it becomes very, very easy for for the team, for the leadership, for the management to decide. Uh, what to retain, what not to retain, what is the utilization of this data, and what level of compliance is, 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 is already done and what more needs to be done. I think it just gives a very good perspective to, to, the, to the team, to the leadership of the organization uh, to take the right steps in terms of uh, preparing the organization uh, for, for compliance. And I, I think there's a lot of discussion about uh, consent management uh, 
So again, a starting point, not necessarily no consent, there's already a consent being considered. Uh, is the consent clear? Purpose is clearly stated. Um, can the consent be withdrawn? Can the consent be modified? Um, and within the organization for whatever consent already collected, um, is, is there an audit trail available? Uh, if there is a need for verification, uh, can it be recalled, right? Or can we can we track the consent? So all of these are questions that come around consent. Consent is not only just consent, but uh, you know, consent for what purpose? Uh, you know, consent for how long? And uh, uh, can consent be withdrawn? Uh, can consent be modified? All of this will come into the consent management uh, part of it uh, when when the act has to be has to be complied with, uh, and and. And then I talked about you know retention of data, deletion of data. I've talked about this in the rights. Uh, so the individual, the data principal, you and I as individuals have the right to request the organization to erase our personal data. Obviously, subject to you know completion. As I said, I gave an example of a loan cycle closure. So subject to all of that stuff, uh, has has a right for um, requesting re erasure of data, even if it is not requested. I think it is obligatory upon the organizations are not to use the data beyond uh, the the the, uh, the permissible consent that was given by by the individual so how do you track uh, you know millions of different timelines and data points uh, as to when should it be erased and how long should be retained from a compliance point of view of dpdp act and also from a, from a, a you know industrial regulation or a regulatory body of the specific organization right how do you track all of that so obviously you need application systems which will help you track uh, as to how long this has to be retained and when it should be erased. So I think that's a very important step. It is, it's uh, technically the last mile of the journey of compliance, but I think it's a very important step uh, to complete the entire entire cycle. And, you know, Marian will talk a little bit more in terms of how uh, DP, DPM can help in, in all of these aspects of, uh, of the compliance from an operational uh, standpoint. And just moving to customer, when I say customer is it's you and me, data principal, uh, and I refer to as customer here, um, customers should have a grievance redressal mechanism. Uh, I'm sure all organizations have some form of a grievance redressal mechanism for, for the existing services. But uh, uh, is that organization trained enough to be able to answer questions on data privacy, point number one? Point number two, can they access the relevant information to answer the questions? Uh, is the systems designed? Is the processes designed to be able to retrieve data if it is requested and if it is needed, right? So uh, just, just talking about that, the customer also has a uh, right to seek clarification on where all the personal data is used in the organization and for what purpose, right? So uh, organization should be able to retrieve, uh, which I talked about audit trails. Uh, trails should be available as to where all the personal data and what stages of the processing within the organization a personal data was used so that you know appropriate response can be can be given so uh, you know enabling the grievance redressal mechanism uh, in terms of knowledge and um, uh, to respond to questions and also in terms of ability to access the required relevant information to answer the question is also very very important if you look at it from a customer standpoint or a user standpoint or from a data principle standpoint and the second part is about you know in in the in the unfortunate event of any data breach, right? Uh, is the is is the process the standard operating procedure in terms of actions to be taken, information to be communicated to the affected individual whose personal data is is leaked, or to the regulator, uh, you know, and and authorities around, uh, is the SOP in place? And if the SOP is in place. Uh, has a tabletop exercise being done of this SOP is also very, very important because, you know, any any, any of these um, emergency measures will have to be tested uh, well before uh, to ensure that, you know, uh, A, the standard operating procedure works, uh, B, all are prepared and familiar with all the, all the, all the stakeholders involved in this exercise are familiar with the exercise. So I, I think it's SOP in place, yes or no. Uh, if SOP is in place, has a tabletop exercise has been done, yes or no? I think it's very important, you know, if you look at it from a customer and uh, and a regulator standpoint. Lastly, from a governance, right? If you look at the governance structure, um, I think the, the the bigger question and the debate has always been, you know, who has to be responsible for uh, uh, for the data privacy within the organization? And obviously, the conversation is about uh, 
uh, is it infosec um, uh, which it is not um, uh, it should it should be a data privacy who owns the data in that organization who is responsible for uh, the personal data again when i say data it's a personal data it's not the entire data in the organization infosec is more about security the data privacy is about ensuring privacy of the personal data and complying with the requirements so who in the organization will have the primary responsibility of managing overseeing and ensuring the compliance of the all the personal data in the organization i think that's uh, that's very very important so that there is a responsibility there is a visibility there is accountability and you know um, ensuring that reporting is also done effectively well and 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 as as all the organizations are governed by by the board uh, has the board already been informed which i i, I, assume, I assume that it, it is at this point in time uh, and has the board been updated in terms of where exactly your respective organization is at this point in time from a compliance standpoint and what is what are you doing about uh, preparing yourself for uh, for compliance i think uh, board update uh, including this in the board subcommittee meeting agenda uh, it's very very important so it becomes a part of uh, of the discussion wherein um, for example if it's a data privacy officer or a data protection officer who is responsible for uh, for the data privacy within the organization um you know he or she would be able to present it to the subcommittee in terms of the progress the compliance the status the issues all of the stuff and which subsequently you know as, as a normal process get presented to to the board so that everybody in the organization including the board is completely aware of of the data privacy and i'm not talking really about uh, the the penalties involved um i think significantly heavy penalties involved for non compliance uh, and not to mention about uh, potential impacts on the brand the brand image and the services etc uh, i think there's a lot of implications so i think it's very very important to ensure the the board is always kept up to date kept informed uh, and kept ahead of uh, the, the, the the information in terms of where the organization is from a data privacy plan, uh, compliance standpoint so this is you know uh, if we were to explain um, the act uh, the implications of it and what organizations possibly need to look at uh, in in a kind of a nutshell uh, this is how i would kind of summarize uh, for, for for the organizations in the country as i said you know um, uh, it, it would you know uh, i think roll out in possibly two parts for many organizations one is starting to prepare for compliance and the second one is ensuring ongoing compliance so i think that's a way i foresee the implementation within within the organizations in the country thank you so much nanaya this was a great presentation and i think you you gave a great overview of the dpdp act and implications for the organizations i do have a question for you um as we are all aware the introduction of uh, complex regulatory frameworks like the dpdp act can often feel overwhelming for organizations especially as they strive to ensure compliance while continuing to operate efficiently given the breadth of information and the intricacies involved it can be challenging to know where to start so based on your extensive experience and understanding what advice would you give to companies at this juncture how should organizations begin their journey toward compliance with the dpdp act Oh, thanks, uh, thanks, Marian. A, a very good question. I think you know where to start is is, a, is an important point. I think I, I referred to that briefly uh, in terms of um, in my previous slide about uh, uh, assessing where exactly the organization is from a privacy compliance standpoint. So I think that's uh, to me uh, a very good starting point uh, and and potentially a right starting point. And then one could always decide as to how the implementation should look like in how many phases. Uh, obviously uh, we we don't know the time frame for implementation at this point in time when notification comes obviously we would know whether it is 6 months or not, you know it's 12 months or more or less we would know about it so given the time frame for implementation you know if the assessment is done right now uh, organizations will be ready to you know kind of agree to a plan for implementation when the notification happens rather than waiting for the notification to come to start making an assessment i think that's a great place to start and the second thing that one could always do it's 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 hygiene issue as well right to figure out where exactly 
the personal data is sitting within that organization, right? You know, where all it is sitting in the organization. I think if you have the inventory of it, uh, as I said, when the notification comes, you know where you are, you know where all personal data is sitting in the organization. Then you could decide as to, you know, how do I implement what to retain, what not to retain, how do we go about it? And, and the lastly, the, th the third point is, um, Generally, you know, the viewpoint is that uh, collect as much as personal data you can at the point of interaction with the client. Um, so collect as much data. I think, you know, that mindset change has to start. Collect what is required for the purpose for which you're collecting the data, right? So which is very, very important. So the collect. So lesser you collect, lesser is the risk. Higher you collect, higher is the risk. And higher is the maintenance cost. Higher is the tracking cost. Higher is the monitoring cost. So lesser data you collect, data for which purpose for which the data is required. I think that possibly would be very, very useful change in the mindset. And along with this, I think getting the entire organization sensitive to the DPDP Act um, and its um, requirements. Uh, I think it's not only one person, and I, I talked about a data privacy officer or a data production officer who could be responsible for this, but he's not the only, only person who would, he or she is not the only person who would be responsible for uh, the privacy, right? It is the entire organization. There are many different uh, individuals who will be involved in the process processes I think it is important to create that awareness within the organization. You know, it could be training or a briefing, it could be workshops. Um, you know, very, very important to ensure that everybody in the organization understands the sensitivity of personal data. This is where I would kind of, you know, uh, I would kind of start the journey. Uh, agreed, agreed. Thank you very much. I also agree that uh, the definitely organizations should start changing the culture. And uh, the first step is probably to do uh, an assessment to see where they are, what is their current privacy posture. Perfect. All right, so uh, moving on. Uh, and uh, at this point, I would like to remind everyone to use the Q&A feature. We can see a lot of raised hands, unfortunately. Uh, we won't have time to stop the presentation and answer the questions, uh, not, uh, not until uh, 10 minutes before the end. So if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, you can also contact us later. We will leave our contacts uh, before the end. So now to delve deeper into the legal dimensions of compliance and the specific obligations that organizations face under the DPDP Act, we have our next speaker, Mr. Sukarn Singh Maini. Sukarn is a respected technology lawyer and a well-regarded expert in data protection. Today, he will guide us through the legal obligations under the DPDP Act, offering an in-depth look at the legal landscape and what it means for your organization. So Karn, we're eager to hear your insights and learn more about the legal nuances of the DPDP Act. So the floor is yours. Thanks for the introduction, Marian. And thanks for that ex excellent explanation, Anaya. I am sure that I don't need to go into as much detail anymore because you've covered so many things in detail now. I'll be skipping over your uh, customers' rights because Nanaya has covered them very well. I'll go straight into the obligations that are present on your company. Now, when you're collecting any information from your customers, normally called data principles, or even if you're collecting this information from others and you're going to use it for something, you need to provide a notice before that collection happens. This notice needs to contain a few different elements that we'll be going over a little later in this presentation. You need to take their consent, but if you don't take their consent, then there are a few alternatives. Those alternatives are limited. The exemptions are also limited. We'll go over those as well today. You need to execute data processing agreements with all your service providers so that you are safeguarded. No matter what happens, if there's some breach of personal data, whether it's a service provider or whether it's from you, you are the one who ends up being responsible for it as a data fiduciary. So you need to make sure that you are properly protected and your service providers all implement the appropriate safeguards so that no breaches happen and no sharing or usage of data happens where it should not be happening. You need to implement technical safeguards. These include organizational measures as well. Nanaya has gone over those pretty well, so I won't be covering those in detail in this talk today, but basically you need to have a track of all the data that you're bringing in, 
the purposes for which you're going to be using it, how long you wish to retain it, or what guidelines exist for its retention, such as do you have legal obligations for its retention? Do you have any purpose for which you would want to retain that data beyond the initial timeline for which the customer is using that service? Or do you have some other purpose which you expect the customer to tell you about later, which would extend that timeline? So those guidelines should exist in your company and your technical and organizational measures should also include security safeguards, which would be how secure the data is so that it does not get breached. Do you have account management, access control and other measures in place? Do you transfer the data in an encrypted form or is it going over plain text over the internet? Do you appropriate authentication protocols and other security measures in place? Do you regularly check your systems for breaches or for any lapses in security or any gaps in your security measures? And do you fix those? So all of those you should be recording and you should be keeping a log and a track of. Because for many of these obligations, when there's an issue and you're investigated, the burden of proof ends up being on you to show that you took appropriate safeguards and appropriate measures. If you didn't, then that could affect the amount of fine or whether or not there's a fine at all. The fines under this act are pretty severe. Of course, it varies on a case by case basis, but the maximum cap that has been prescribed is 250 crores. So compliance is better than going for an investigation and a fine later on in this case. The board here, sorry. Um, yeah, let's move on. So notices. When you're collecting information, you need to take consent from people or you need to fall under one of the other brackets for legitimate interests or an exemption. But the primary area under which most companies are going to be using personal data in India would be under consent. And when you take someone's consent at the time of collection of their personal data or before that collection happens, you're supposed to provide them a notice that their information is going to be collected, what purposes it's going to be used for, what their rights are and how they can exercise them. How can they raise their grievances or complain? So in your own internal procedures in your company, who is the one who is responsible for handling these complaints and how can they be contacted? And if that also fails, then how do they approach the board to raise a complaint there? All of that needs to be covered here. But apart from this, there are some rights that people have which would affect what can be done here in this case. People can ask you who their data has been shared with. So all your service providers, all the other data fiduciaries that you sell or share data to, you would have to provide their identities. That's another thing that you should be keeping track of. Some companies might go for an easier way here by listing it all up front. And some companies might not wish to list it all up front and provide it on a case by case basis. But in either case, that record needs to be maintained so that you can easily hand it out when a customer asks for it. The, unfortunately, the timelines within which that handing out of information to the customer has to happen and the timeline within which their rights have to be complied with, that's not clear right now. That's going to be prescribed later on, but right now it's as soon as reasonably can be done. In other laws across the world, some timelines have been established. For example, in GDPR in EU, there's a 30 day maximum timeline, even though the law says that you have to do it as soon as reasonably possible. So in this case, we still have that as soon as reasonably possible. We just don't have that maximum timeline that could come in later. And you should be prepared to have a timeline that is possibly going to be shorter than 30 days. Right. Consent. Now, consent is one of three grounds under which you can collect and use information. Usage of information here, when I say use, I also mean storing it. I mean using it for any purpose that the customer has accepted or using it for a purpose that you are required to under the law. Before you use data, the ideal situation is that you take their consent. If you've taken their consent before this act comes into force, then in that case, when the act comes into force, you're supposed to provide everyone a notice of everything that we covered in the previous slide. And you're supposed to tell them who the data has been shared with. Once the act is in force, 
going forward, you're supposed to get consent from everyone following the notice practices that we discussed in the last slide. You're supposed to maintain records of how exactly this notice was presented and the consent was taken. If you don't have those records, then that consent is not valid. When someone gets their, gives their consent to you, their consent can later be revoked as well. If the consent is revoked, then all the processing that's happening for a purpose that they are consented to, that must stop immediately when they withdraw their consent, except for a few exceptions. If you're required to store it for a legal obligation, then you can continue storing it. If you're required to hand it over to law enforcement, then you can continue doing that. If you're required to use that information to pursue your own legal rights or exercise your legal rights, such as recovering a loan amount, then you can keep it. If you require that information for some action that the customer had taken, then you can continue using it, such as the example given in the act itself is somebody buys a product on an e-commerce website. The e-commerce website has to deliver that product. But before they deliver it, the customer revokes their consent. In this case, the company can still go ahead and deliver the product. They are supposed to use it, that information to deliver the product. They're not supposed to stop processing it at that stage. They're supposed to stop processing the data and delete the data after that delivery has been done. Consent must be free. This means that the customer cannot be forced to give their consent for a particular purpose, and you cannot club together multiple purposes under a single consent umbrella. The customer must be able to choose between that. They must be able to give their consent freely, and the consent must be specific. The consent cannot be wide. If it's uh, if the purpose for which they're giving their consent is anything that the company offers in future can be used by the customer, then that's not valid. That's not a valid reason to take the consent and that's not specific enough. It must be for these particular products and services that the company offers. For that, these are the particular actions that can be taken by the company related to the personal data. It must be informed. This is the transparency that happens under the notice in the previous slide. It must be unconditional. The customer cannot say that I'm giving you my consent, but only because of this, this reason or only so that this can happen. The consent has to be unconditional for that specific purpose. The consent has to be unambiguous. It cannot be mm, maybe. It cannot be all right, uh, I'll think about it. And in the meantime, perhaps. All of that cannot be done. The consent has to be given with a clear affirmative action. There have been instances in the past, and this is a, this is a widespread practice as well, that a lot of companies in their terms and their privacy policies, they would have a pre-tick check, checkbox. That cannot be done. It has to be an action from the customer that they're giving their consent. When you change your privacy policies, in that case, a lot of companies would send out a notice saying that our practices are changing. If you continue using our services, then you're accepting these new practices. Or they would say that our practices are changing. And from now on, we are going to start selling your data or sharing it with these companies. That cannot be done. The customer has to give their consent with a specific action. This could be when the privacy policy changes, when they log into their account, they click an agree button to continue using the service with those new practices that you've put into place. Now, apart from this, there are special guidelines. Uh, sorry, Marianne, we're going to stay on the consent slide for a little while. Um, there are special guidelines and considerations for children and disabled people who have guardians. In that case, the guardian or the parent is the one that has to give the consent and the one that can withdraw consent. And there are also cases where consent managers can step in. That's a potentially new business idea here, but these consent managers also have obligations. If they don't fulfill their obligations properly, then they are the ones who can face a fine as well. If they don't pass on withdrawal of consent or giving of consent on time, or if they don't act in the favor of their customers, then they are the ones who can be pursued. And they also need to be licensed and registered. There are legitimate purposes under which companies can process your personal data. I'll only be covering the ones that are generally relevant to companies. I will be skipping over the ones that are applicable mostly to government entities. So in legitimate purposes, if someone is giving you their personal data voluntarily and 
they don't give a consent along with that data, but they tell you the purpose for which they're giving you that data. Then you can use that personal data for that purpose. You don't have to get their consent in a separate procedure following the consent procedure that you would normally do. If you're required to retain or process data or to provide data to someone under an applicable law, then you can do that. If there's a court order or a tribunal order or a direction issued to you, then in those cases, you can process that data. Or the last one is that if there's an employment related purpose, in case you're hiring someone and you need to process their data for that, or if you're providing certain benefits to your employees and you're processing their personal data for that, that too is allowed as a legitimate purpose. There are limited exemptions as well from people's rights and your obligations, including consent, but those rights are limited. And in case you're ever going to use one of those, you should be consulting a lawyer before you actually use that. If you are enforcing a legal right or a claim, then you can use the data. If the data is required for prevention of a crime or an investigation, then it can be used. If the data principle is outside India, and the processing is happening under a contract that was also executed outside India and you're processing the data in India, then that's allowed. In case of an m &A transaction or restructuring or similar events, if this event is approved by a court, then it can happen. Then the data can be transferred between these companies as required. And the last one is for research, archival or statistical purposes. Traditionally, this is the ground that has been used across the world for scientific studies or educational purposes. It's not something that has traditionally been used for a company to improve its own services. But since the wording is not that specific right now in India, we'll see how this unfolds as the time, develop, as the time goes forward. Yeah, let's move on to the next slide, please. Thanks. Right. Data processors are anyone to whom you provide personal data to process it on your behalf. Processing is a wide term. It covers storage, it covers usage, it covers transfer, it covers modification, it covers erasure, it covers basically anything that you can do related to that personal data. So if you are transferring some personal data to a third party who is providing some service to you or related to that personal data, then that third party is a data processor. Now, data processors are supposed to comply with the law themselves, but you remain liable for all their actions and activities under the law. If you yourself are a data processor, then you should be careful not to step into the role of a data fiduciary. You should be careful not to use the data for your own purposes. Otherwise, your obligations under the law increase and you could potentially be facing damages or losses in case of a case. If you are a data fiduciary and you're handing data over to a data processor, you need to ensure that you have an ironclad agreement with that data processor to protect you in case the data processor uses the personal data for their own purposes, or there's a data breach, or there is some non-compliance. And you should also look through whether or not they have the appropriate measures in place to actually help you comply with the law and your obligations under the law. The agreement should have rights related to the data subjects, how long the data processor can take to comply with that and so on, your obligations and the data processor's obligation in helping you comply with your obligations under the law, maintaining records and providing you a right to conduct an audit if need be, providing you breach notifications in case there's a breach, otherwise you would never know that there has been a breach and you would remain liable for not notifying the board and the data principles in case of that breach. It should have some indemnif indemnification clause so that you can be made whole if there's a breach or if there's a misuse of data. And it should cover what happens in case of third party transfers or use of sub processes by your data processor. If they themselves are using a third party service provider, such as for storing the data online, then in that case, your agreement with your service provider, with your data processor, it should be clear enough to lay down whether or not they need your consent to hire someone to do this job, whether they need to notify you when they're hiring or changing these service providers. Each service provider there could have 
different security measures in place and the compliance levels could vary. So you remain liable even in case of those subprocessors. So you should be clear about what your risks are. Yeah. And if you yourself are a data processor, then you should build data subject rights and compliance with obligations into the software or the service itself. You should provide direct controls to your customers to exercise these rights and obligations so that your customer service burden is reduced so that you don't have to deal with a daily case of this person wants to modify this data and this person wants to retrieve this data. Yeah, we can move on. Right, significant data fiduciaries. This is the last thing that I will be covering. Significant data fiduciaries are not specified exactly in the law. These are entities that are going to be determined in future based on rules that are notified by the government. It depends on the volume and sensitivity of personal data that is being processed, whether or not the processing itself is going to cause any risks to the rights of data principles, or it is likely to cause any harms to them, whether it could affect public order, whether there's a potential impact on the sovereignty and integrity of India, whether it could affect the security of India or a state in India, or whether it could be a risk to electro electoral democracy. For now, unless you're a large company, this is something that you can gloss over and come back to later on. But if you are designated as a significant data fiduciary, then in that case, your obligations include appointing an independent data auditor to verify your compliance with this act appointing a data protection officer who will be based in India and who will act as a point of contact for grievance redressal. But this data protection officer would also handle providing guidance and measures to your company for compliance with the law itself. You're required to undertake data protection impact assessments, periodic audits, and such other measures as are prescribed by the government in future. Data protection impact assessments are assessments of what data you're going to be using for a particular service, how you're going to be using it, what purposes it will be used for, what impact it could have on data subjects or data principles, or if that data is breached or leaked or misused, and what impact it could have on them if it is used in the way that it is intended. You are supposed to record all of that, and you're supposed to be clear that this risk to them is not going to be severe. Yeah, we could move on to questions. Okay, Th thank you, Sukarn, for the informative presentation of the legal obligations under the DPDP Act. Uh, we do have a questions before we go to the Q and A. Uh, I will just uh, say a couple of words about data privacy manager and how technology can help. But uh, to all dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, as part of the webinar, we will now be rolling out a poll featuring a few carefully selected questions. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to gather your insights and perspectives. So your responses are very valuable to us and they will help uh, shape the direction of our discussion and future initiatives. So please take a moment to participate in the poll before we conclude today's session. Uh, your input will be greatly appreciated and I really can't wait to see your responses. Thank you in advance uh, for the participation. So uh, just briefly, uh, the legit as the company, uh, we have our flagship product data privacy manager, and this is one of the leading uh, privacy management platforms. That means that we have been designing for years the product to help organizations with data protection regulation such as DPDP. Everything you heard today is uh, for sure difficult to implement, but this is why we have created the product and this is where we can help streamline the, the compliance efforts. So uh, in terms of the industries that we serve, we really sit nicely across many different verticals as all of you in different industries have very similar problems when it comes to managing personal data and to implementing data protection, both technical and organizational security measures. So what Data Privacy Manager 
actually is. It is a modular software solution with many different modules, each of them designed to solve specific compliance challenges. Like you heard today, there are challenges regarding third party management, regarding consents, regarding the rights uh, of the individual. So uh, all of these different areas present challenges to their organizations and each of the modules of the data privacy manager platform are actually designed to solve these specific challenges. If I just briefly go and guide you through our process of implementing data privacy manager, we really start with discovering personal data. Once we know uh, the whole landscape of personal data, we move on to the assessment phase. Just like Sukarn mentioned, you need to do, a, for example, a data protection impact assessment. This is one of the types of privacy assessment that you can do automatically with Data Privacy Manager. And then what we do is we centralize all this information, like what you do with personal data, where you do it, who you share personal data with, and so on. This is the part which we call centralized. And then managing consents. Managing consents, this is a big area. Just managing consents and preferences is like a solution and a product for itself. Also data breach management is included here. And then we move on to the fulfillment phase. So this is the interaction with data uh, uh, fiduciaries, with uh, individuals and with their requests uh, regarding their rights and how you provide them with their rights. And then the removal phase. We have heard a lot of times about uh, uh, data retention policies and how do you actually delete personal data. So it, it is really difficult to do manually. So what we do with DPM is actually help you navigate the data privacy maze. And uh, we are a software vendor. We have partners such as Nanaya and Sukarn who help us with the organizational and legal part. And we are focused on implementing data privacy manager. But before you start with the implementation of the software, you need to be prepared, you need to be ready. So really, like Nanaya mentioned in the beginning, the real first step for you is to do an exercise called, called state of privacy assessment to see where you are, what is your maturity level at this point. So I really uh, uh, suggest that you uh, get in touch with us. We can really help with this. And uh, you can ask a demo or data privacy manager. But I think, first of all, uh, the best thing you can do at this point is really start with a privacy assessment. And we can, we can really help you with this. So this is the time where we will be taking questions. And uh, looking at the time, uh, I'll try to be quick. So. Nanaya and uh, Sukarn, uh, the first question that we have is, uh, how do we monitor or operationalize data retention, deletion requirements when an organization not only need to follow DPD, DP, but they also need to uh, adhere with respect to other local legal requirements or obligations? So Sukarn, do you want to take this one? Yeah. The law allows you to retain data if you are required to for compliance with an Indian law. But if this is for compliance with a foreign law, then it only mentions court orders. If you're required to comply with a court order of a foreign jurisdiction, then you can process that data for compliance with that court order. Now, compliance with different laws across the globe, most are similar in terms of your obligations just the retention timelines might vary. How long you're supposed to retain the data before you're required to delete it, or how long you're supposed to retain data for compliance with the local law. The thing is for compliance with local laws where retention is required by the law itself, that usually pertains to data originating from that jurisdiction. Usually, not always, but that is the norm. If it varies from that norm, then case by case, we would have to look at it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think the next one is uh, for Nanaya. So how do NBFCs implement this law and start moving toward the compliances as per RBI? So, yeah, good question. I think NBFCs are obligated, you know, have a regulatory requirement to comply with RBI uh, regulations as well. So um, it, it's the privacy uh, is guided by the DPDP Act, uh, need to ensure that 
um, that is complied with. And uh, obviously when that is complied with, I think it will answer all the compliance, most compliance requirements of RBI uh, from a data privacy point of view. Uh, so, and you know, what more would be a guideline from RBI? I think we'll have to wait uh, on top of the DPDP or when the DPDP Act gets notified. But I think the primary obligation for organizations and NBFCs would also be to ensure compliance of a DPDP Act, and which is the personal data. And uh, once you comply with it, uh, obviously you will comply with that element of the compliance requirements of RBI, unless something more gets notified. I think which uh, which which we'll have to wait and see as to what additional notifications for compliance will come from RBI for NBFCs. Thank you, Nanaya. Uh, the next one, I think, uh, is for Sukarn. So what what is likely to be the implementation strategy of the Indian government? Well, going by how they've implemented things in the past, it could be a rushed timeline or it could be relaxed. We don't know for sure until it happens. <laughs> okay. My own expectation, there is no... Uh, reason behind this expectation that I could explain to you, but my expectation is that there is likely to be a timeline of six months for implementation. It could be shorter or longer, but based on past interactions, that's my belief at the moment. Yeah, so no, now is the time to uh, uh, start getting ready, right? Okay, so the next one is... Uh, the 2022 version of uh, ISO 27001 says uh, about protection of personal information, PII. Do organizations need to implement DPDP entirely to comply with the control? Uh, logically, I'll take that. Logically, the answer is yes. Uh, DPDP Act compliance is required. And I think it's a much broader question between protection and privacy. So, you know, protection is protecting the entire day, you know, personal data, but ensuring privacy is largely, not largely, it's the guideline of a DPDP Act. So uh, I don't think uh, either or, uh, you know, the way the, the act is structured, uh, DPDP is an act. So I think, you know, at least my reading is that we need to ensure, not my reading, I think that's, way it will pan out, uh, is that need to ensure compliance to DPDP Act. Thank you. Thank you very much. So just looking at the time, we will take one more questions. And since we have a lot of questions, we will try to answer, answer them as a follow up to the webinar. Uh, anyone who wants to get detailed, more detailed information and answers, please get in touch with us and we'll try to help you as much as we can. So, so the next question I'm looking at is uh, around the DPO. Uh, the question is, will this officer have authority to authorize the consent taken and shared to the respective department of other official bodies? Will it be in a form of raising a request which will be approved manually? Um, Sukhan, do you want to answer that? I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm so, reading to the question as well, but yeah, I don't think I understand the question itself. Will this officer have authority to authorize the consent taken and shared to the respective department or other official bodies? So I think it, it, it's around the authority of the DPO and what will be there. Yeah. yeah, so the role of the DPO is to make sure that the organization complies with the law. The role of the DPO is to guide the organization in its compliance journey and to make sure that any grievances that are raised by data principles are resolved. The role of the DPO is not to be the one who individually takes consent from every single person or undertakes the transfer itself. They are the ones guiding the overall procedures and the processes that are in place in the company. Thank, thank you, Sukar. That, that's clear. All right, Nanaya and Sukarn, thank you very much for, for the presentations and for answering the questions. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being so active, for posting the questions and for answering our poll. Uh, we will have uh, much more of these webinars in the future. In the meantime, please get in touch. And again, thank you all for being a part of this webinar. And I hope it was informed informative and useful for everyone. Thank you and
See you again. Thanks, Maria. Thank you, everyone. The next one. Thanks, Thank Maria. you, Nana. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a Thank good day. You. Have a good day. Bye.